church family. It is uh, good to be with you in this new and different way. Thank you for uh, logging on and uh, using this video wherever you are on your Sunday morning. Uh, I want to start just by saying how very proud I am to be a part of Corvallis Evangelical Church. This has been a very unique uh, week in the life of our church, our community, uh, our nation, and our world. And uh, I just feel so blessed to be a part of this church community. Uh, in the difficult decisions our leaders have had to make, we've uh, kept uh, our vision to love God, love people, and serve both at the center of those decisions. And as we've communicated those out to all of you, I've been so blessed to hear how you are already uh, calling one another, checking in with each other, asking how can we help, what can we do to serve our community with no strings attached. And so it's such a blessing to be a part of a church that is seeing um, this challenging season as a way to allow God to work in and through us to be the hands and the feet of Jesus. I'm hoping this uh, short video uh, is a, just one part of uh, your Sunday morning worship. Wherever you are, whether you're at home or gathering with a community group, uh, maybe you're in Corvallis, maybe you're at the beach, who knows where you might be. Um, but wherever you are, we are still the church. And the church is still called to worship Jesus because he is worthy of our praise. And our city needs people interceding for them uh, in the presence of Jesus. And so on our website, you've also got a, a worship guide, a document that gives you a couple different ways that you can sing together, uh, pray together, read scripture together, and reflect on some of the content I'm going to share here in just a minute. Uh, so I would encourage you to utilize that. Uh, if you don't want to, then at least uh, either before or after this video, take some time just to reflect, just to pray, just to worship God for who He is through song, uh, through prayer, uh, through journaling, however, however it is. Let's take time, even though we're not together as the whole church gathered, uh, to worship Jesus uh, together as a church family. Uh, so uh, before we open God's Word in Mark 4, uh, would you join me in prayer as we begin? Lord, we thank you. Uh, that you are with us. We thank you that you are not surprised by any of the circumstances that we find ourselves in, both as a community and individually, and that your Holy Spirit is at work. And so I pray, God, for an outpouring of your Spirit in new ways, in unique ways, in transformative ways, that your kingdom would come, your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. Be with us now as we open your word. Would you give us eyes to see and ears to hear what your spirit wants to say to us as your church, your body. In the strong and powerful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. In high school, my family took a trip to Hawaii. And uh, as part of the trip, each of us were allowed to pick one activity that we wanted to do. And so um, I, wanting to be adventurous, decided I wanted to go sea kayaking. And my brother and my dad went along with me. My sister and my mother, wisely in hindsight, stayed home. So we went, and we'd never done this before, and we got uh, to the place, and they showed us how to do all of this stuff. And uh, they showed us how to use the paddles, and then they said, there are two islands kind of within this area, these two reefs. There's a short one, and then there's a, a farther one that's, you know, a little ways away. We recommend you go into the short one. Well, I was 16 years old and, uh, and was pretty confident in my abilities. And so I decided that I was going to go, and uh, my dad and, and brother agreed, we're going to go to that big island out there, because it didn't really look that far away. Uh, so we started to paddle, uh, and we got out there easily past the first island, no problem. Um, but, and they had warned us ahead of time, but what we didn't realize until we got out there was that the waves were a little bit bigger than what they looked like on shore. And so when we got into the middle of this, uh, the waves were coming up and over, and it was a perfectly calm day. Uh, there was a little bit of wind. But the current and the waves began to uh, move our kayaks in, in, in ways that we, we didn't know what to do. And my dad and my brother got, got uh, separated. They were kind of off on their own, and I had a kayak to myself. And so um, I was there trying to get to this mountain in the distance, this island that felt so close, and yet at that moment felt so far away. And I'd never felt so alone in my life. And it was at that moment that I realized, this is how I'm going to die. 
This is where the shark comes and gets me. Uh, this is where it all kind of ends for me. And I've had a good, good 16 years, but this is kind of it. He drowned in Hawaii sea kayaking. Um, there, there he lies. Uh, and uh, just as I'm thinking all of that, I'm afraid and I'm, I'm scared and I'm alone, something comes up out of the water next to me. And in my shock and in my fear, I move away from this thing and I fall into the water. And I just kind of remember curling up into the water just waiting for the shark to get me. Because I was sure it was a shark. And nothing happened. So I kind of floated up and I got to the other side of my kayak and I peered out over the kayak and right there floating next to me with what I'm sure was a smile on his face was a turtle. I was embarrassed and uh, thought about not telling anybody but the turtle. Uh, he agreed he'd keep it quiet. Uh, but I think this story is a great illustration of how fear can get the best of us in our lives. And so, um, thankfully, I'm not alone, and maybe you're not alone sometimes in stories and ways in our lives where we tend to get overwhelmed uh, by what, the what-ifs, what could be's, uh, the, anx the anxiousness that causes our body to shut down. Um, and uh, we have a God who understands that and wants to invite us to choose faith over fear. And so... Mark, we're actually already scheduled months ago to look at Mark 4 today where Jesus calms the storm. Uh, so I, I love that God just picked this text just for this weekend because I think there may be a few real life applications for us today. So if you have a Bible, turn with me to Mark 4. So far in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus has, has shown up on the scene and he's announcing the good news that the kingdom of God is coming. He's doing things like healing people and casting out demons and proclaiming the good news that would mark for everybody that, that he is a prophet sent by God. But so far, he's stayed within the boundaries of, uh, or the fence, if you will, of the faith of the day. There were other miracle workers. There were other people that were doing things in the Jewish movement. They were ready for God to work. And so uh, Jesus is kind of beginning and doing some new, so, uh, not doing anything new, but doing some powerful things that show that God is, is with him. In Mark 4, we see now Jesus doing things that are different. He starts to break outside or through the fences of the faith system in his world. And so we see in Mark 4 that Jesus has been teaching in parables. He's been teaching in stories about the kingdom and that it's this explosive, world-changing thing that kind of, kind of breaks out of our normal parameters. And at the end of that day, in verse 35... Uh, Jesus gives his disciples an instruction. It says, that day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let's go over to the other side. Now, what you need to know about where Jesus is, is that he's at the Sea of Galilee. And the Sea of Galilee is actually a freshwater lake. Um, but on the north and the west side of the Sea of Galilee is the Jewish side. Uh, and that's where the fishermen, where Peter and James and John and many of his disciples get called. That's where Capernaum is, where Jesus has set up his home base. Okay? But on the east side of the lake is the Gentile side, the non-Jewish side. And uh, most likely, many of these Jews, because they were devout, uh, did not go over to the other side of the lake. And if they did, they only went there because they had to. Furthermore, um, even though the disciples were fishermen, they would not usually go out across to the other side of the lake. They would go around uh, the shoals, the, the shoreline, and kind of work from village to village. Uh, and the reasoning for that is twofold. One, the boats were not that big. Uh, and two, uh, very, very quickly, still to this day, uh, in Israel, uh, wind and storms can come up, come up quickly in the Sea of Galilee. Uh, I've been there three times. Two of the times that I was there was sunny and beautiful. One time uh, it was stormy, it was rainy, uh, and I was in a nice big boat, so we didn't have a lot to be afraid of. But it was kind of cool just to see. So Jesus says to his disciples, let's go to the other side of the lake. Okay, let's go to a new place, and he starts to push through the fences of their faith. Because Jesus' ministry, what we're going to realize in Mark, is not just for the Jewish people, it's for everybody. So leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat, and there were other boats with him, okay? So the other boats are following him, the other disciples are following him, and we get the, the, the 12 in the boat with Jesus. Sure enough, a furious squall came up, 
and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Uh, there's a great, uh, if you Google um, the boat uh, that was found in the 1980s in the Sea of Galilee, uh, you can see an actual first century boat. Now, we, probably not the one that Jesus you know, was in, but it gives you a great example. Okay? And they're not that big. Again, they weren't designed to go all the way across the lake. They were designed to work the shore. Okay? So this boat is, in, is getting swamped. The water is filling in. And Jesus was in the stern sleeping on a cushion. So I don't know if he took Dramamine. I don't know if he was just super tired from the day. I don't know if that cushion was really comfy. But for some reason, Jesus is sleeping. Now, this little phrase, Mark wants us to begin to think about some things happening in the Old Testament scriptures. Because remember, Mark is Jewish and he's building on these stories from the Old Testament. And if you've read the story of Jonah, you know that Jonah goes out into a boat. There's a great sea, there's a great uh, uh, storm that God sends. And yet Jonah is asleep in the boat. So something's going on here. Jesus is asleep on a cushion while the disciples are fearing for their lives. I don't know about you, but there have been times in my life where I have felt like I was sinking. And more often than not, I also feel at that moment like God is sleeping. <laughs> where are you, God? Why are you not working? Why are you not saving me? Why are you not delivering me from this unpleasant situation? Okay, this is not unfamiliar in the scriptures to have this experience. And so what do the disciples do? They wake Jesus up. And they say, teacher, don't you care if we drown? Which means these fishermen, um, who may or may not have been able to swim, uh, thought they were going to die. They were, they, were, they were really afraid of drowning, so much so that they woke Jesus up. Now, it's fascinating, Jesus' response. Okay, a couple different things. It says he got up, which he stood to the full measure, is kind of this idea of who he really was. And he rebuked the wind and said to the waves, quiet, be still. Now, this phrase uh, is the same phrase, that Jesus, the same thing that Jesus is doing when he's casting out demons. He's rebuking the demons and he's telling them as they come out of people to be quiet. The other thing that the Jewish people believed about these big bodies of water, whether it was the Mediterranean Sea and even the Sea of Galilee, was that they could be possessed by demonic forces. They could be possessed by the, the demons of chaos. And so here is Jesus exercising authority, not just over uh, the powers at work in people's lives, but over these powers of the deep, this primordial chaos. And so Jesus gets up and he says, Peace, be still. And it says that immediately the wind died, and it was completely calm. The wind and the waves respond to Jesus immediately. He has authority over these things. Now, there's a couple really cool psalms that talk about someone else who can do this type of thing. And I have one of them in your worship guide. I would encourage you to read it in Psalm 107. In Psalm 89, I think is where it's at. Let's see if I can get there. Yep, in Psalm 89, verse 8, here's what it says. Again, this is many, many years before Jesus. Who is like you, Lord God Almighty? You, Lord, are mighty, and your faithfulness surrounds you. You rule over the surging sea. When its waves mount up, you still them. Jesus is breaking through now the fences of their faith, and he's doing something that is completely unique. Yeah, he's doing it in a similar way as the way he was casting out demons and the way that he was healing people, but now he is exercising authority, not just in the ways that they would be used to a miracle worker doing, but in a way that now only God can do. And so he calms the storm, and he looks at the disciples, and he says this, this powerful phrase. And if you take away anything from this short video, I would encourage you to take away this question, because it's something that God has used in me these last three or four days, as I'm thinking about uh, our church and how we respond, as I'm thinking about my family, as I'm thinking about our nation and our country, and all the what-ifs, and all the possibilities, and, and what the future might hold. And if I'm honest, those things 
cause anxiety with me. I like knowing what's coming. I like uh, um, uh, having this sense of knowing how to respond. And, and when I don't, I, I feel afraid. I feel afraid. Uh, and and that, that fear comes from this place of not having control. I like it when God works within the fences of my faith. Because God and I can work together and interact, but there's these normal parameters that I'm used to. But when God starts to push outside those fences, when he starts to do different things, when the circumstances of our world start to change, that sense of control, the illusion of control that I have, begins to dissipate. And I have fear as a response. Jesus looks at his disciples after, after, this is good, after he's calmed the waves, after he's calmed the storm, and he invites them to choose faith over fear. He says, why? Why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? Now, these aren't necessarily encouraging words um, to the disciples, but they're words of challenge, not just for them, but for us. When I feel fear, when I feel anxiety, I, I know what it feels like in me. It's right in here is where it happens. And maybe you have different places where it feels, or you have different triggers or different things that kind of point to, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling a little bit afraid here. And the question is, why? And Jesus asked us. He, he wants to be a part of that conversation. Why are you so afraid? And then the invitation is, where is your faith? Do you still have no faith? Okay, why would Jesus ask that to the disciples, to me? He's inviting us to remember who he really is. Here, Jesus has just calmed the storm. He's just done something very unique, and he's going to continue in the next couple chapters to do unique things. He's going to bust through the fences, the parameters that they're used to. He's going to heal the sick. He's going to cast out demons and Gentiles. He's even going to raise a little girl from the dead. That's a spoiler alert. He's going to do things that they're not even ready for. And so he invites them in this moment to reflect on why they're afraid and their level of faith. Because this faith in what God can do is what ultimately is going to heal these people in the next couple chapters. It's their faith that Jesus can interact with them and he can set them free from the things that ail them. He can set them free from their worry. He can set them free from their pain. Maybe not in the ways that they anticipated. Maybe not in the timing that they anticipated. But God is at work still doing what he did on the Sea of Galilee that night. Now, what's funny about this text is when Jesus says, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? It says they were, they were terrified. <laughs> they, were still, they were still afraid. But it was a different type of fear at this point. It was not a fear in the wind and the waves anymore. It says they were terrified of Jesus because they realized something, because they knew the Psalms. They knew that there's only one person who can do this. And so they asked this question, and we talked last, last week. Uh, this is the core of, of Mark's question in this first part of his gospel. Who is this? Who is this Jesus? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Now, this is a rhetorical question. And for us, it invites us to answer the question. Who is this? Who is the only one that the wind and the waves obey? Who is the one that, that brought order out of chaos at the beginning? Who is the one that brought the Israelites through the Red Sea and into the desert and the promised land? Who is the one who calms the storm, who invited Jonah to embrace his mission to the Gentiles, who is with the disciples, who is with you and me? Who is that person? God Almighty and Jesus, his Son, and the Spirit who is living in each and every one of us. So today, this day, I want to invite you and me to choose faith over fear. I don't know what you're fearing in your life. I can't answer that question for you. Why are you afraid? But Jesus, when he calms the storm in our life, invites us to reflect. Invites us to pause, to be still. And know that he is God. To remember what he's done. To remember that God is perfectly comfortable working outside of the fences of our faith. And he actually invites us into new ways of expressing trust in him. Church, we've got an amazing opportunity. In the midst of crisis. 
in the midst of uncertainty, in the midst of sickness and illness and whatever else is coming our way, to choose faith over fear. Now, faith includes being responsible. Faith includes being informed. But if I'm constantly on social media, not to be informed, but to somehow fill a need that only God can fill, and it's causing anxiety, it's causing fear, why am I so afraid? Do I still have no faith? What is it that God might want to do in your life in this season? How might He be calling you to be a calm and non-anxious presence in the lives of the people around you? Again, stay informed. Be responsible. But may God help us to see how we can be His hands and His feet in this time where people are realizing their desperate need for God. We're going to continue to work our way through the Gospel of Mark. We're going to continue to serve our city with no strings attached. We're going to continue to reflect the grace and the compassion of Jesus. That's who we are as a church. We are going to continue to love God, love people, and serve both. May God invite you to choose faith over fear and to acknowledge that He alone is the one who can calm the storm. Amen. May God be with you as you worship Jesus, as we as the church together follow Jesus outside the fences of our faith to wherever He may lead.